This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And welcome to this time of worship on this beautiful Sunday, this beautiful Lord's Day. We're glad you're here with us as we worship together. And I hope all of you, uh, whether you're a longtime member here or visiting with us today, hope you'll sign the friendship sheet as they go back and forth, the, the, the pads at the end of the row. So we can have what, a couple reasons we have that. So we can have a record of you being here with us today, but also so you can look on the sheet and see who's worshiping down from you. In case you don't know them, we encourage you to greet one another following the service today. Grateful to have the handbell choirs. Grateful for every expression of music that adds richness to our worship. But glad for the handbell choirs choir to be here this morning. There is a bulletin insert this morning uh, that I just ask you to kind of set that aside. We'll be using it later in the service today, uh, but don't get rid of it uh, because we will be using it later in the service. Take a look at the uh, things going on in the life of the church this week. I won't highlight those, but just uh, see opportunities for study or service that you can uh, uh, would fit into your life, and we encourage you to be a part of those as you are able. As we look ahead to next Sunday, uh, there's a football game going on next Sunday evening. You've heard of it, Super Bowl. Christian churches around the country have turned that day into a day of giving. Uh, and actually, our, in our bulletin, there it's a typo. It should say Super Bowl with an O, S-O-U-P-E-R Bowl, uh, because that's the day when you are invited, when we are invited, to make a small contribution as the youth stand at the exits a uh, dollar or two or ten or more, uh, and, and all those dollars stay in our community to address issues of hunger in our community. This has been going on for a lot of years now. Uh, it's been a, a, it's, it started in a, small, in a small church in Columbia, South Carolina, and now it's really a nationwide effort. And so we're proud to be a continuing part of that Super Bowl. But we're going to take that a step farther this year and try something that we've not tried before. It says there, Super Bowl of Caring, Flag Football, and Tailgate. Okay, so next Sunday, the plan is for a church-wide event. It sounds like a kind of a youth event, but it's not. It's a church-wide event. From 12.30 to 2, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have, we're going to gather at Pullen Park. Um, it, and, and wings and hot dogs and drinks will be furnished. We invite you to bring a side dish and a can of food for admission. The can of food is not to eat. The can of food is for our FPC Shares program. And so a side dish and a can of food, and we will have um, some, half, some events at this uh, uh, gathering. There will be a touchdown dance competition. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Uh, some of you are already entered this. You don't know it yet, but you've already been entered this. <clears throat> There'll be a long pass competition and a, a, a kazoo chorus. And so it sounds like a lot of fun. 12.30 to 2, Pullen Park, church-wide event. Uh, that would give you a chance to, to get home, change clothes, get comfortable, and come on back to Pullen Park, 12.30 to 2, next Sunday afternoon. If you have questions... Uh, particularly to see if you are signed up for the touchdown dance competition, be in touch with Carol Safransky or Beth Thaxton. They are uh, the masterminds of this event. Another reminder, last week the, our rock stars were uh, lined up in front of us to tell us about who they are and what they do. They reminded you that they're gonna, they're in, their annual fudge sale is going on, and so now's the time to place orders for that fudge sale. And you also may remember that all the proceeds for that sale go to support the work of Leon Dorleans, Haiti Outreach Ministries, uh, to support the work he's doing, trying to minister to the poorest of the poor in the poorest country in our hemisphere, which is really to say a lot. So I'm grateful for the rock stars for taking that on as a particular mission. It's a win-win for folks, good fudge uh, to support a good cause. And so we hope you'll uh, uh, Order fudge from the rock stars uh, this week if you can. 
Our FPC shares item for this month, the month of January, is canned fruit. If you've already contributed to that and are ready to turn the page to the next month, in the month of February, we'll be uh, receiving as much uh, or as many canned beans or dried beans uh, as we can as we stock three local food pantries and try to help them as they minister to, to those who depend on those food pantries. But again, uh, we're glad you're here with us as we worship God today. Use the time of the prelude to continue preparing yourself for this time of worship.
But in the spirit to worship, let us call ourselves to worship. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the presence of the congregation. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. just sang that we're a happy chorus. We sang that all was joy and sunny and victorious. But in our daily lives, in our work together as a church, are we always the loving, hopeful ones? Let us pray together our prayer of confession. All of creation sings your praises, O God. By their very existence, the flowering plants and the flowing water and wide array of Earth's creatures testify to your grandeur and your glory. But we, with voices to do so, are too often silent when we should be singing, too often silent when we should be declaring your praise. Forgive us, O God, for failing to do what you created us to do, which is to glorify you in thought, word, and deed. Move us beyond our fixations on lesser things, that we might dwell on your might and majesty, and thus live lives of endless praise through Jesus Christ our Lord. The words for joyful, joyful, we adore thee, were inspired by Psalm 145, which also inspires us with hope, reminding us that the Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling. The Lord is near to all who call on the Lord. God is near and we are forgiven. And that's good news.
Please be seated. You know, at any time, there are uh, dozens of people that are in orbit of our church. They say, well, we're getting ready to join, and then they're out of town for the next month or something. So today we have several people landing from orbit. Uh, y'all are going to join us today. So if y'all would come on forward, and I would, they've already been received by the session. They're official First Presbyterians, but I wanted to uh, introduce them to you, and they will be up here after the service if you'd like to uh, extend the right hand of fellowship, as is the uh, longstanding tradition in this church. I'll start with Rachel Sabo here, who's been coming to this location for some time. Her daughter, Ada, is in the Child Development Center. Uh, and Ada turns four this May. Yes. About time to graduate. Rachel has a Roman Catholic background, but now she's Reformed. And so we got her. <laughs> she works for PRA International. They do clinical trials. She does their tax stuff. They don't give her many days off this time of year, so we're glad she could be here today. And her elder is Hope Carmichael, who's the chairwoman of the board of the Child Development Center. So that worked out really good today. Let's see, uh, Jamie, let me do, do you next. Uh, Jamie Abbott and Brian Fillard, two wolf packers here. Uh, Jamie's with Duke Clinical Research Institute, a fine clinical research institute. <clears throat> She's in business development. Brian, who has an MBA from State, is with Quintiles. And they are a couple of faith. They are hoping to be married here sometime this fall, assuming the sanctuary is built by then. So they're, <laughs> and by then they will have been together for three years. So. So this is uh, Jamie and Brian, and their elder is uh, Ed Yeoman. Let's see, then here we have a, a famous name twice over, Catherine Allman. She's married to uh, Matt Kesterson, a famous name here at First Pres. As her father-in-law, Dave, likes to say, his two children came out like Jesus. One is a carpenter and one's a minister. <clears throat> <laughs> Matt's also a good photographer. I don't know if Jesus took pictures, but... <clears throat> And Catherine's last name is Almond, A-U-M-A-N, a, a well-known name to many moms here whose babies were delivered by her father, Dr. George Almond. And her mother's name is Kathy, a popular name in these families here. Uh, she's a dance director at Arts Together. Uh, Dave says she's a good dancer and a good dance teacher. So if you're going to work on your touchdown dance for next Sunday, you know, you'll see, <laughs> see Catherine here. She's uh, joining us from White Memorial, reducing their membership by one. So. Hope they don't notice. Um, Matt and Catherine have two children, ages three and five, Levi and Delia May, and her elder is, of course, Dave Kesterson. And finally, Henry and Amanda Boyd. A winding road led them to us, which began in Wilmington at St. Andrew's Covenant Presbyterian for Amanda, and for Henry in Pantigo at the Covenant United Reformed Church. Amanda is an ECU alum. Henry went to the school in Chapel Hill. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> they met while playing kickball and they were married in Wilmington during Hurricane Irene. He works for the state of North Carolina. Henry's a specialist in social security and Medicaid programs, which is a very much of interest to uh, her, Ken, Ken and me. Um, Amanda is now nurse care manager with community care, but she was a traveling nurse. And that's where the story gets real interesting. She was working at Duke Hospital, a fine hospital. <clears throat> Sometime in the, December, uh, the time of December 09, I think it was late at night, she was visiting a patient, and the name on the patient's door said Elizabeth Ham. We know her as Lisa Ham. And they got to talking about church, and Amanda mentioned that she and her fiance were looking for a church in Raleigh, and they had visited White Memorial. Lisa rose up and said, oh no, you don't want to go there. You want to go <laughs> to First Presbyterian. And so they did. And so to the very end, Lisa was doing church work and gave us one final gift. We're glad to have Henry and Amanda and their elder is Ken Kirby. And again, hope you'll uh, greet them after the service today. Thank you. In addition to all those uh, celebrations, we collected a few concerns between the early service and now. Some folks that we didn't know were in the hospital. Um, Nan Humphrey, who normally is up here singing in the choir, fell on Friday, broke a hip, had surgery Saturday. She's at Duke Raleigh, room 3237, if you want to get us here. Uh, Dean DeMacy is going in for um, hip surgery tomorrow. George McFadgen was hospitalized uh, Tuesday at Wake Med in Cary with pneumonia. Uh, another former uh, choir member, or a former choir member, Jim 
Terry, a long time member here, was, whose voice, uh, whose nep- see, niece, rather, um, Sue Cammon sings in our choir. Uh, Jim was hospitalized at Rex. Uh, he's uh, being treated for cancer. He's been discharged and sent to Mayview. Jim is 91 and a half. Uh, Ruth Hay was hospitalized briefly last week. And Terry Beckham continues to recuperate at home. Oh, one more. Uh, Tom Whittaker. He gets to see his orthopedist tomorrow. He was out working in the yard, tripped over a stone, and broke two bones in his ankle yesterday. So that's why he's not ushering today. And we still have several who are at home uh, recovering from various conditions or undergoing uh, treatments at this time. Keep them in your prayers. When I saw that uh, the theme for the day was learning how to pray, I was reminded of this book, Living Prayer. The, one of the very first things I did when I got to the church, it was back in uh, early 2000, we had a group that met on Sunday nights and studied this book by Maxie Dunham, Living Prayer. I think we met on the second floor of a building we didn't know was crumbling around us at the time, but, but we prayed. And they, <clears throat> So it was a really good book. It was interesting to see the, the people that were in that uh, group when I was there. In this book, we reminded that, that we all should pray more regularly, probably, than we do, that there is power in prayer. And, of course, he reminded us that the Bible's prayer book and hymn book is the book of Psalms. So I'm going to begin the prayer today with uh, some words from, from our hymn book. The words were written by the uh, great professor, poet, and musician Thomas Troger. And then I'll weave in some words from uh, Maxie Dunham from his book, uh, Living Prayer. Uh, one of the most helpful things that Maxie says in here is that prayer is simply talking to God about what's important to you today. So let us be in prayer, beginning with uh, the words of Thomas Troger. Let's pray. Dear God, when I bend upon my knees, clasp my hands, or bow my head, Let my spoken public pleas be directly, simply said, free of tangled words that mask what my soul would plainly ask. Let my actions, Lord, express what my tongue and lips profess. Almighty God, you know our needs before we ask, and you love us better than we know how to love ourselves. As Augustine said, for thee we were made, O God, And our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. And so we come to you in prayer, seeking you, asking for your blessing and guidance, asking for your special presence and comfort for those who are struggling at this time in their lives. And as you touch their hearts, we pray that you would open our hearts to your love and compassion. As a fellowship, as a group of believers, As a flock of your fold who would be disciples, we pray. And as your servant Maxie Dunham says, there are only two legitimate prayer positions. Kneeling in prayer, saying, thy will be done. Or standing erect in readiness, saying, here I am, Lord, send me. Lord, hear our prayers. As we pray as Jesus taught his disciples when they asked for his guidance on how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to join me. I'm going to sit this way and look at you on the carpet.
you've already heard a little bit about what our topic for the day is. We're talking about prayer and we learn to pray by praying. That's the way we learn things. And a scripture lesson tells us that Jesus' disciples wanted him to teach them to pray as well. And so he did. And that, that prayer is right here in the Bible. You can look it up. And it is Luke chapter 11. And I'm going to say these verses with you. And then y'all repeat them back like you always do when we have a prayer in um, the sermon, children's sermons on Sunday morning. So we're going to spend a few minutes talking to God. That's what prayer is. And you repeat back to me. Father, hallowed be your name. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. That was a long one to remember, wasn't it? <laughs> um, and do not bring to us the time of trial. We don't need to, wor to worry so much about what we say, but about how we feel when we say it. And if we go to God and pray with loving hearts and seek his guidance, he will answer all our prayers. Thank you for coming. And you may go to your seats now. <clears throat> Let us pray. Dear God, illuminate the scriptures for us and help us to hear your word with new ears. Amen. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his per people the power of his works, in giving them the heritage of the nations. The work of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. The word of the Lord. We turn now to Luke's record of the gospel, a story already referred to a time or two, very familiar to us, as Jesus' disciples want him to teach them how to pray. From the 11th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Listen again to God's word for us. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again, let us pray. God of grace and goodness, surround us, fill us, stir in us by the power of your Spirit, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I gave myself an assignment this week. I decided to write a psalm. I've done this before. I've been in workshops where psalms were studied, where we'd learn about the various types of psalms, the characteristics of those psalms, and then we'd try to write one in that category. So maybe we'd study for a while the characteristics of a praise psalm, and then we'd write one. And then we'd study the characteristics of a psalm of lament, and then we'd try to write one. You may not know that there are lots of different types or genres of psalms clustered among the 150 psalms in our biblical book. But it makes sense, doesn't it? If you you leafed through our hymn book, we'd find all sorts of different themes emerging. And as as we've already said, the book of Psalms was, in a sense, the worship book of the people of Israel. It's a reflection of the worship and liturgical style of the people of Israel. And so if you think about it, if worship is coming into the presence of God with the fullness of who we are, we do come into God's presence with praise and lament and thanksgiving and celebration and a need for deliverance. And so to find these themes reflected in the worship life of the people of Israel just makes sense. So this psalm I've written, which is found on that insert in your bulletin, I guess would fall in the general category of a psalm of praise. And what I want us to do is to read it together in unison. Now I know we preachers usually do all the talking during sermon time, and I know I'm intruding on what is for some of you a quiet time. That's a euphemism. (laughs) Some of you have already kind of settled in, but bear with me, this won't take that long. And we usually preface a reading like this saying, hear the word of the Lord, but let's be clear, this is not the word of the Lord. These are words I wrote this week, but let's read them together. Praise the Lord. All praise be to you, my Lord and God. Blessing and honor are yours forever. Call upon the name of the Lord. Demonstrate reverence as you stand before his throne. Exceeding riches have been given to us. Faithfulness is God's gracious gift. Give glory to the God of grace. Honor the Lord of all creation. I will praise the Lord's name as long as I live. Joy wells up in me as I ponder his grace and favor. Kindle within me a spirit of gladness, O God. Light a fire of devotion within my very heart. Make me your own, one of your covenant people, not like those who stand apart from you. Open your hands to me. Receive me with mercy. Pardon my iniquity, O Lord, now and forevermore. Quiet in me the voices of those who call me away from you. Restore me to your fold, a sheep in your safekeeping. Sanctify me, O God. Bless and use me as your faithful witness to tell of your salvation, to announce your good news. Under the shelter of your wings, I take my refuge. Visions of your kingdom bring comfort to my soul. With songs of praise on my lips, I will worship you. Exaltation shall well up within me. You are great, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Zion itself cannot contain the full measure of your glory. Praise the Lord. 
So, I wonder what came to mind as you made your way through that psalm. Some of you may have read it before worship began, but for others of you, that was probably your first time through it. So, I wonder what you noticed. You probably noticed that it's filled with all sorts of Bible-sounding language, but if you wrote one this afternoon, you could use more informal speech. There is no right way or wrong way to do this. You may have noticed that it's actually a mix of praise and confession and celebration and a plea to be useful to God. And so this particular psalm, like lots of psalms, are lumped together different elements from various categories. But I wonder if you noticed something particular, even peculiar about this psalm, about how it's put together. Well, rather than keep you in suspense, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. With the exception of some poetic license that I used toward the end of the psalm, this would be what is known as an acrostic psalm, where the first line of the fir- for the first word of the first line comes from the first letter of the alphabet, and each succeeding line begins with the next letter of the alphabet. You can look at it again. All, blessing, call, demonstrate, exceeding, faithfulness, give glory, and on and on and on, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, until I had to finesse the X with exaltation. (laughs) Maybe some of you can give me a better word for that, but I couldn't fit X-ray or xylophone into this psalm, (laughs) no matter how hard I tried. But all the way down to Zion, this psalm is referred to as an acrostic where it moves from A to Z in a systematic, orderly, methodical unfolding, line by line, so that when the psalm comes to an end, you have, in a sense, exhausted your language's capacity for singing praise to God. Now, I've put you through this little exercise because the psalm we read as one of our texts for today, Psalm 111, is an acrostic psalm, as is the next one, Psalm 112. Actually, those two psalms were designed to be read together. But Psalm 111, after the initial Alleluia, praise the Lord, follows the Hebrew alphabet. But I can't really point that out to you because that pattern is lost in the translation to English. But every half line in that psalm goes from one letter to the next in the Hebrew alphabet, which starts with Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, and on and on and on. Bob could go farther than that. He's kept up with his language skills better than I have. But the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. And so the writer of this psalm, Psalm 11, and those who wrote the few other acrostics, employed this method to construct their hymn, their song, their poem of worship and praise. There aren't many of these in the scriptures, but there are enough of them to suggest that this was a style and an approach to the construction of psalms that would have been familiar to God's people. The question, though, is why? Why go to the trouble? Why constrain yourself to fitting a psalm into this rigid pattern? Why not just write as the Spirit moves you? Well, there are a couple reasons that someone might choose an acrostic style. One, as I've already suggested, is to be able to say that I have praised God from A to Z. That I've gone from the beginning to the end of the letters that I have available to me. That I've exhausted the letters I have at my disposal. And I've used every one to say what I have to say about God. Maybe it was a good preventative to keep a writer from saying the same things over and over again to use a new letter, maybe even a new word, so that the acrostic psalm becomes a creative challenge, stretching me, pushing me, making me think about what I want to say and how I want to say it. 
I've told you before, I think, and you may know this, about the Islamic tradition of carrying sets of beads that are either 33 in length or 99 in length. And one of the disciplines of an Islamic day is to say the 99 attributes of God while moving along those beads. As they move to each new bead, they recite another attribute until they've named the 99 attributes of God. The goal of that, I think, is to stretch how they think about God. Now, God has more than 99 attributes. This could go on all the time. But their 99 challenges them to think every day about the fullness and richness of the character and nature of God. These acrostic psalms, I think, are partially the result of wanting to do the same thing. To come up with new ways to talk about God, to stretch their vocabulary about God, to think about new ways of praising God, new ways of praying to God. Again, as a way of saying that our God is to be worshipped from A to Z, Alpha to Omega, beginning to end. But there was another, maybe more practical reason that these acrostic psalms may have had a place in the Israelite community. Maybe because they followed the alphabet, they were easier to learn and easier to teach to their children. I have a terribly hard time memorizing things. Poems, biblical texts, sermons. One of the most panic-stricken times in my life is as a middle school student when I was expected to stand in front of the class having memorized the poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade. (laughs) My hands, my palms are still sweaty (laughs) as I think about that. But I think I would have had a better chance at memorizing it if it was put together in a format and a structure that I already knew. That might be what's going on here. These acrostic psalms may have been put together in a way so that children or adults, having learned the letters of their language, would then use those letters and have those letters as a cue to how the next line would begin, and the next, and the next. And since written language always emerges after oral language, when these psalms finally began to be written down and written language became more more a part of the culture and the community, this would have been a natural way to teach these psalms and commit them to memory. One of the most important things one generation in the faith community can do for the next generation is to help them learn the vocabulary of faith, of worship, of discipleship, of prayer, of praise. This was particularly true of the Israelites because the Israelites always seemed to be on the verge of obliteration. They were always under attack, under siege, being deported and exiled. Sometimes their only best hope was that a small remnant of their people might survive. And so they were feverishly intentional about teaching their stories, their history, their traditions to their children. Why? So as they grew up, they would know who they were. Tom Long, who some of you met last year in Montreat, who was a a preaching professor from Atlanta, tells the story of one of those rare Sundays when he was not in the pulpit preaching, but sitting out in a pew in worship next to his 11-year-old son. It came as no surprise to him that his son didn't seem fully engaged in every aspect of worship. Instead, he was doing what I did when I was 11. He was scribbling in the margins of his bulletin. He was playing with every loose strand of thread on his shirt sleeve. He was counting the panes of glass in every window in the room, basically killing time. But 
when it came time for the congregation and to stand up and say the Apostles' Creed, Tom Long said that he was struck by the familiar voice to his right. It was the voice of his seemingly disinterested 11-year-old son standing up, articulating the historic faith of the church. He said his first thought was, where did he learn this? But his second thought was, I know where he learned it. He learned it by going to Sunday school every Sunday his whole life. And by sitting in worship, hearing those words repeated again and again, and then saying those words again and again until they found their way into him. And at that moment, he said, he was never more grateful for the church, which was helping his child learn who he was. And so one of the reasons these acrostic psalms were used, at least according to one scholar, was so that children could learn them and remember them. So the language of praise and thanksgiving and lament and celebration would become a part of who they were. That's still a very important part of our mission around here, to remember that our children don't learn the faith or the language of faith just by breathing the air inside a sanctuary. They learn it as they see it lived out before them, as they hear the songs and the creeds and the prayers and the hymns and the great stories of Scripture. They learn it when we as a community are committed to teaching it to them, sharing it with them, so that they will know who they are and whose they are. And hopefully having seen such faith and faithfulness in us, they will come to love and serve the God we know in Jesus Christ with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength so that together we might worship the God of Israel, the God of the church from A to Z. To God be the glory now and forever. Amen.
us affirm our faith, saying together the words of the Apostles' Creed, which are found on page 14 in our hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Let us present unto God our tithes and offerings.
Let us pray. Gracious God, take these offerings of hand and heart and use them to further your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen.
Let the lives you live be an ongoing psalm of praise, a chorus of glad thanksgiving. And may grace, mercy, and peace, the triune blessing of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and abide with you, with those you love, and with God's people everywhere, now and forevermore. Amen.